waters explore a dead hollow tree. Half its trunk is on the shore, the other half is in Mayaka River. They swim into the hollow from underneath. Inside they climb above the water. The space is dry and air comes through holes made by woodpeckers. It is a perfect den and the mother gives birth to three kids. Three weeks later, the mother and father began teaching them to swim and to catch food. At three months old, the otters could live without their parents, but the children may stay with their parents for two years. One day in June, it rains and the otters play. Leaves and sticks are slick with wetness, so the otters make a slide on the riverbank. Crayfish scuttle from the rising river. The otters make a game of catching and eating them. It rains and rains. Their den is flooded inside, so the otters sit outside. A young otter dies for a fish and the father scolds. Otters are good swimmers, but the current is too strong and it carries the otter downstream. Dressed in rain slickers, two men stand near a pickup truck. They watch the Mayaka River flow over State Road 64. The otter hears them talking. I can't remember flooding like this, a man says. Summer of 1992, it was so bad that they closed State Road 70. A second man says. The first man says, I'm worried about the phosphate mine north of here. It sends clean water into the river, but I hope it stops while the water is this high. The second man says, Hey, look, there's another a little one. First man says, Probably not quite a full grown Lutra canadensis. Hey, what? The second man asks, Lutra canadensis is the scientific name for the North American river otter. First man says, I call her Lou for short. The second man tugs on his cap. Hey Lou, you better go under rather than over the highway. Even as the man speaks, Lou dives into the current. It rushes her under the highway. She surfaces on the other side. The man claps his hands. Nice going Lou, enjoy your swim. Hi, I'm Carol Mahler, author of Adventures in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed, the story of four animals and their neighborhoods, published by the Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program. It's distributed to children in seven counties that are part of the estuary program, and environmental educators and scientists from those seven counties helped me write the book. What they did is they created what we call sidebars or little pieces of science to help explain what's going on in the story so that as a writer I could concentrate on writing the actual story. We've asked some of those, we asked all of those environmental educators and scientists to come and read their work for us and some of them are here to do it with us. Uh, today, I have Angie McStravick with me. Hi, Angie. Hi, Carol. Nice to see you. <laughs> and where are you from? I work for the Environmental Education Program of Lee County Schools. Um, today, Angie's going to read a section about the otters. Um, this was originally written by Diane Heron, Polk Environmental Education Resource Center Director. Uh, she wasn't able to be with us today, so Angie's going to read it. Otters are active mammals, eating, playing, running, and swimming any time of day or night. They move from place to place, but will return to a favorite spot. Sometimes they make stick homes near ponds that they plan to return to, but these are only temporary or vacation homes. Otters seem to be fun-loving and playing all the time, but they can bite and scratch when they need to defend themselves. In or out of the water, they eat fish, frogs, crayfish, turtles, muskrats, and even baby alligators. Female otters give birth to one to five blind, furry babies, which will grow to be three or four feet. Thank you for reading that, Angie. Now, I've been in a lot of classrooms reading this book, and when I was in the Lee County Schools, every classroom that I went in, I asked the children if they had seen otters, and they all raised their hands. Carol, that should not be an unusual response for our area here in southwest Florida, because we have otters in a lot of our waterways, Six Mile Cypress Slough, Telegraph Creek, so those students should be able to see an otter on a regular basis. Now, have you ever been close to an otter? Mm. I lead a lot of trips through the Six 
Smile Cypress Slough, and I have been close enough to see them swim and play, but never close enough to touch, which is how it should be, because they are wild animals, and we should leave them wild. Now, they're very playful uh, animals. They are, and it looks like great fun to join in their fun, right? But again, wild animals, they have wild instincts, and we need to leave it that way. Thank you so much, Angie. My pleasure, Carol. Current slows as the river enters Flatford Swamp. Water spreads across the low-lying ground. Sand Slough meets six creeks here. Ogilvy Creek, Boggy Creek, Coker Creek, Young's Creek, Long Creek, and Maple Creek. A man and a boy stand together where Mayaka Road crosses Taylor Road. The water almost covers their knee-high rubber boots. Lou rests at one end of a log. Her dark brown fur matches the log's color. An ibis stands on the other end. Lou hears the people talking. Wow, well, Daddy, was it ever like this? I mean, when you were, when you were a boy? Yes, the river flooded, but the swamp was shady then, just full of trees, the man says. The boy asks, What happened to them? They died. You can see the trunks and stumps. Folks say too much water killed the trees. Some have fallen too, just like that log where the ibis is just landed. How can water kill a tree? The boy brushes a bug from his arm. A tree needs time when the land is dry. You know how you kids say you want to stay in the pool all day, but you want some time to dry out too? Yeah, so why did the tree stay wet? The boy asks. Lou watches a damselfly. Ranchers around here used to run cattle. Then about 20 years ago, some planted crops like tomatoes and watermelons. In the dry season, they watered them, and the water that the plants didn't use ran into the swamp. It was wet. It was wet all the time, so the trees started dying. The damselfly lands on the log near Lou. The boy looks around. But I see some trees. That's because some farmers are using a new system. It keeps the water in the fields and out of the swamp. The boy says. That sounds good. The damselfly skims the water. A ba bass strikes it. I think it will help the swamp. Maybe the farmers too. It costs a lot in the beginning, but using it over and over will make watering the crops cheaper. Lou watches a bluegill caught for a moment against the log. The boy points to the log as Lou glides into the water. Hey, Daddy, that log's moving. Lou catches the fish and eats it as she moves away. Hi, I'm Carol Mahler author of Adventures in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed. Today, I'm at the television studios of the school district of Lee County, and with me today is Melissa Nell Kane. Hi, Carol, how are you today? Good, Melissa, thanks for being here. Great, well, I'm happy to be here. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you all about agriculture, and I'm gonna read a contribution by Curtis Porterfield, who is with the Polk County Natural Resources Division. Agriculture is growing food, in Florida, citrus trees are planted in groves and fruits and vegetables are planted on farms. To make these plants grow well, farmers fertilize them. To make sure bugs don't eat them, farmers spray them with pesticides. When it rains, fertilizers and pesticides get washed into the surface water and groundwater. One problem is that fertilizers will make water plants and algae grow so well that they crowd out other living things. Another problem is that pesticides can hurt some animals. Many farms and groves move, store and use water to the advantage of the plants. This may reduce the supply of groundwater and cause other problems. Thanks for reading that, Melissa. Now, we have this situation where everybody wants water. People need water, plants and animals need water, agriculture needs water. What do we do? Well, that's a really tough question, but it makes sense when you think about it because just about everything needs water to either grow or live or just survive. So really the trick is, is finding a balance and making sure that everybody gets a little bit or at least as much as they can use in order to survive. Now I've heard that some parks in our watershed, and particularly in Manatee County, used to be agricultural fields. It's true. In Manatee County, our biggest preserve, Duet Preserve, which is over 22,000 acres, 
much of it was agriculture. And up there we had um, citrus groves, like we mentioned in the reading, but also tomato farms as well. And so what did you do? How did you turn fields <laughs> into a park? It's a long process. I always like to tell people that when you buy a chunk of land, you can't just put a fence up on there and put some trails in there and open the gate open and say, everybody come on and it's a preserve. It's a lot like painting a picture. And you guys probably know what's the first thing you're going to do. You draw what you want to have happen. And then piece by piece you add to it. So first you make your sketch and we plan out what we want to do. And then you get your paint and whatever tools you need in order to make the picture. For us, that means with fields, we might have to do things like maybe dig up some of, the, some of the remnant pieces that are there. A lot of times there's a lot of exotic invasives there, so we have to remove those first. And then we go in and we use um, an entire palette. Like ta Again, talking about an artist, they have their palette of colors. We have our palette of plants, and we'll bring those in, and we'll plant them and do some restoration work. Now you have to choose the plants well because they have to suit the habitat and, and they also have to create a habitat so that animals will come in. That is absolutely true and it's tricky here in Florida because in Florida, um, I'm sorry if any of you guys have ever seen a Florida mountain, you'll have to take me to find it because I've never seen one in Florida. So here, just you know, an inch, for us that's a huge change in elevation. So certain plants want to be really low, other plants want to be really high, so we have to be really careful. But there are clues that let us know what plants might like to be there. And what's really exciting is, yes, um, the agriculture was there and it was active and that did put a lot of stress on the ground, but underneath that there's what we call the seed bank. And over enough time, a lot of those native seeds that are stored under there in the ground will start to pop up too. So the land really helps us rebuild itself. Wow, that is really neat. Well, thanks for talking with me today, Melissa. I really enjoyed it. My pleasure. Have a good day. The river has flooded Mayaka City Park. Three black vultures perch on the dead branches of an oak tree a white egret stands on a picnic table and watches a green plastic soda bottle float by. The swings in the park are underwater. Lou finds the black rubber swings pulling downstream on their chains and swims against one. She feels how it holds her belly as she moves over it. The swing turns suddenly and flips her upstream. She dives and flips again. Crossing the bridge, a mother pulls a red wagon. Two girls sit inside the wagon. The five-year-old sits in back and has her arms around her sister, who sits between her legs. The mother pulls the wagon onto the shoulder of the road. She points to Lou. Look, girls, the otter is playing on one of the swings. Oh, I want to play. The older girl says. Me too. Her little sister says. Their mother warns. Don't be silly. You can't play in a flooded river. It's dangerous. The current is very strong, and all kinds of things get in the river. Trash and animal dung, big limbs, and other things can hit you. The mother watches a red and white plastic cooler. It is caught in the branches of a willow. Now the current pulls it free. She points. There's someone's cooler. It's floating like a boat. It looks just like ours, Mama. The older girl says. It's going to hit the otter, her sister says. The woman calls. Watch out, otter. Lou has already dived into the river. The cooler floats above her. She swims with the current under the State Road 70 bridge. Hi, I'm Carol Mahler, author of Adventures in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed. Today, I'm at the television studios of the school district of Lee County, and with me is Anita Forrester. Hi, Carol. It's such a privilege to be here today. And I am the teacher for DeSoto County Schools Outdoor Classroom, and I helped with a, a sidebar in Carol's book, and I'm going to read that for you today. Invisible pollution. Sometimes you can't see pollution in the water. Oil, gas, and other fluids from car engines can leak onto the roads and the rain washes them into the river. Rain also washes fertilizers and pesticides that plants can't use into the river. 
Though through natural processes, a river stays healthy by breaking down and recycling pollution back into the environment. But when large amounts of pollution drain or are dumped into a river, it cannot keep up with the self-cleaning and life in and around the river suffers. Scientists and trained volunteers check the water to detect phosphates, nitrates, and other chemicals in the water. Everyone should be careful not to release chemicals into our waters. Thanks for reading that, Anita. Now, just living every day in our lives, we create waste. And some of it could be called pollution. So what do we do? That's right, Carol. Um, it would be impossible for us to not create pollution. But the problem comes when the pollution, the rate of increasing pollution is, is so fast that the self-cleaning environment, the tools that the environment has, at, such as the plants and the trees and the roots that can trap pollutants before the water travels down to uh, the aquifer, this is where the problem happens. If the pollution comes too fast and isn't draining um, slowly, that's when we run into trouble. So it's not that we pollute, that's not the problem, it's just getting us to slow down and think about what we're doing, how we're building our roads and our communities so that we can better protect our waterways. Now I, th I heard you talk about that there were certain roots or plants that could help um, trap certain chemicals or pollute what we call pollution. Right. There used to be a lot of trees along the rivers and and lakes and, and waterways. And it was a natural protection for pollution. Um, most of Florida was, was, the, was logged and cleared. And now we're starting to see, uh, the, realize the importance of, of replanting trees and um, making retention areas when a building goes up so that the water doesn't drain quickly to the river. It drains more, uh, and has a slower process where the some of the chemicals can be removed, such as gasoline and oils. Um, I bet some of the children can look at their schools and maybe see those retention ponds, mm -hmm. those things that are built there. That's right, and one thing at the schools that children could do is to start a campaign for planting native plants around those retention ponds and around their school that will not only attract, attract wildlife to their school so they can have some living critters to study as they walk about their campus, but it, it would also help with the pollution. That sounds wonderful, Anita, and I thank you so much for coming and talking with me today. My pleasure. For free classroom materials, please visit our website at www.chnep.org.